Hi, you're listening to the Sermon Recording Podcast of Awaken Church. Awaken is a church of missional communities whose vision is to see individuals experience healing through the gospel, be raised to their fullest potential among community, and sent out to live a life on mission. You can find out more online at awakenvb.com. And if you live in Hampton Roads, we invite you to check out our worship gathering in the Haygood area of Virginia Beach, Saturday evenings at 5 p.m. Thank you for listening. All right, amen. How's everyone doing? Good, good. Hey, happy th- early Thanksgiving. How many of you guys would say Thanksgiving is your favorite holiday of the year? Show of hands. All right, you guys are terrible. I had a lot of great Thanksgiving things to share, but none of you guys like it, so it doesn't really matter. Christmas, favorite Christmas holiday coming up, right? All right. How many of you guys already had your tree up in your house? Leave right now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so look, thanks, those of us who are diehard Thanksgiving fans, uh, it's not that we're anti the tree, right, or the decorations. You just skip the best holiday ever, and so that's my opinion. But to be fair, Thanksgiving falls a little bit late this year, so I'm giving you all a pass if you've already put up your decorations early. But next year, if you know Thanksgiving resets itself back to like the third week of the month kind of a thing, then I'm going to expect you guys to wait till Black Friday or after to put up your decorations. Cool? That's your pastor's disclaimer. Can we all agree to that? No? Great. You guys are terrible. All right. Cool. Well, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Philip. I'm a highly opinionated person here. I'm also one of the pastors at Awakened Church. But we are in the uh, back end of a series called Better Together. Um, it's been a great series. So if you haven't been here for a week, I know we've had some people under the weather. We've had some travel. Uh, we've had some events going on. Uh, but if there's a week that you have missed, just so that you're aware, you can go on Spotify or on uh, Apple Podcasts and listen to any of the previous sermons in our sermon series, for that matter, any of the ones in the past. Those are usually uploaded on Monday. So just as a friendly heads up for you. But we are uh, towards the back end of the series. And tonight we're going to kind of dive in talking about this idea of really being united as a church and how there's strength in numbers for us as a people. And so one of the things uh, I was talking with actually Connie, who's uh, one of our, who's our spiritual formations director. She is on our co-leadership team within the five of us together. And we were talking this week about this sermon uh, topic uh, for this upcoming, for tonight. And so one of the things that when we were talking about, she was telling me a story about, um, for her as a kid, she can remember, uh, maybe you can relate to the fact that as a kid, you, as you, you played a lot of toys, right? So for me, it was Legos. Um, I did have some like G.I. Joe kind of guy stuff as well. But most of it was Legos, board games. And so there was a lot of, uh, especially with the Lego world, right, there's a lot of deconstructing and then a lot of building, right? And so for her, she was related to the fact that a lot of times with like Barbie dolls, uh, there was a lot of like taking them apart and then putting them back together. And almost like borderline, have you guys ever seen Toy Story? You have Sid, right, in Toy Story. Like the way she was describing it with like legs off and stuff like that, all I thought about was like Sid from Toy Story, which if you've met Connie, she's the furthest thing from the character Sid. She's like this meek, gentle, loving person, but yet there's this depiction of like limbs off of Barbies. And I'm like, do you like strap them to dynamite? Like what's happening? But we had a good laugh about it, but I put this picture up here for you. I want you to see it. One of the things about community that makes it so unique is that if we're not careful, we end up treating community like it's this disassembled uh, uh, body with a lot of parts. And we focus on the parts rather than the whole. Okay, so let me say that again. We focus so much on the parts rather than the whole. And so when we think about community, there is so much power when we do things together, but we're so tunnel visioned at times if we're not careful that we focus on what, what I'm doing, what I'm good at, what's easy for me, what's natural for me, and what, how I view the world through my lens. That's fair, right? I think we could all agree to that. That's how we view the world around us. And if you've ever been in a room with someone who doesn't think like you, doesn't believe like you, doesn't look like you, doesn't act like you, and they suggest things different from you, it can be awkward at times because all of a sudden you have to figure out, okay, where's common ground so we can even move forward? And this is honestly why, in my opinion, why so many people just end up saying, you know what, screw it. We're going to do it. I'm just going to do my thing over here. You do your thing. I can get more accomplished by myself doing it my way over here. Uh, Good luck to you. 
and uh, we'll meet on the other side, right? But we had this mentality at times of like, I'll just do it, right? I can get it done faster. If you ever work in a job where there's a team project, right, or in school, if you remember when like there's the, you know, two or three people working together for a school project and there's this one person who's like not holding up their end of the deal, right? And so you're like, hey man, this is your job to do this task. You know what? Just forget about it. I'll just do it for you, right? How many of you have ever said that before? I'll just do it, right? Anybody? Interactions, helpful guys, or else I'm just going to keep rambling. It's not going to go well. Thank you. Appreciate it, Adrian. So this happens all the time in the workplace, whether it's in school, where we had this mentality. And, and I thought about this concept because I want, I want to read you a verse. So keep this image uh, that you see on the screen now in the back of your head. I want to read you a passage tonight. Um, and we're going to kind of uh, break it down into a few parts. But I want you to think about that image as I read this passage that Paul writes to a pretty dysfunctional church in the early church era. There's a, a church in Corinth um, who, in the part of the gr- Greek society who, man, if there was, a, if there was a, a, a letter or letters, in this case, written to a church that represented just dysfunction, disorder, chaos, a lack of leadership, uh, just you imagine all the problems. They kind of said, We'll be the poster child for all the crap, right? That was them. So we're going to read through this passage together and kind of go through a few parts of it that I think speak to that image and kind of our, our topic for the night. So let's read it together. Starting in verse 12, Paul writes, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slaves, some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. So 21st century version, right? Paul's saying, look, there's one church, one big C church globally. Some are Catholic, some are Protestant. Some are black, some are white. Some are Western civilization, some are Eastern civilization. Some have been Christians for a long time, some are brand new to the faith. Some are skeptics, some are doubters, some are devout, right? There's this, there's this oak open, welcoming version of what it means to be the body of Christ. It's not just this, oh, if you go to church, you're white, middle class, and you are a part of this doctrine, you're a part of the church. And it's really important that we understand that what Paul is writing to is a highly dysfunctional church who didn't understand what it meant to be a body of people together. So his first part we're reading tonight is saying, look, I don't care where you come from or where you represent, that's beautiful. Right? Let's get to where God is trying to take us. Let's stop with the labeling. Right? Let's get past the titles and the labels. Let's look to the person in the process. So once we can get past that, then we can see what God really wants to do. So let's keep reading. He says, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. And he goes in this whole example. I'm going to read it really fast. He says, I'm just going to paraphrase. Right? If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body uh, because I am not a hand, then that makes, does not make it any less part of the body. If the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye. Would that make it any less than a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you ever smell anything, right? He goes on to this basic rant of like, hey, let's just use some common sense examples here, right? Let's use the human body for a second. If we were all fill in the blank body part, how effective would that be, right? And you can go through any number of examples, right? You can think about Sports analogies, you could think about uh, business examples, you could think about a variety of things of how if, you just, if everyone did the same thing, it wouldn't work, right? If, if everyone was the president of the United States, the country would be, we're going to leave that one alone. All right, so if everyone was the quarterback on a football team, right, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work, right? You have to pass the ball to someone, someone has to block, right? Whatever your cup of tea is, the analogy, there's a thousand of them out there, but, but Paul uses this body example for a reason because you and I are all gifted and designed differently. And although we know this intellectually, when we're sitting across from someone, this is one of the first things we forget. That the person that's sitting across from me is different. But yet we talk to them and treat them as if they are us, right? They think like us, they believe like us, they are us just in their form. And it's very um, arrogant to think that the person sitting across from us thinks the same way that we do. Or they have the same belief systems that we do or the same experiences we do. But instead of walking into a conversation, and I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody tonight, instead of walking into a conversation with an openness 
of understanding and appreciating where they come from, where they've been, we end up assuming so much. And then when they don't align with us, we get frustrated, we get irritated, and we end up building walls up. And if you were here a couple months ago, we had a, a guy by the name of Dan White Jr. come and speak about love over fear. And he talked about this basic premise of how when we don't understand something, when we don't know something, we begin over time to build fear up. And that creates walls and boundaries. And this is where most of, in my opinion, to Dan's credit, he wrote about it, and he's 100% accurate, that most people in America fall into that idea of, if it doesn't look like me, sound like me, believe like me, I build walls up, I create division, it's polarized us, therefore I fear it. And if the church can't figure out how to be one body together, how the heck are we ever going to see the world, see a unified church effectively resemble Jesus Christ? So if we can't figure this out internally at Awakened Church, how are we going to impact Hampton Roads? How are your missional communities going to be effective you guys can't figure out if we can't figure out how to effectively be unified as one unification does not mean that we all agree on everything together it's really important being united doesn't mean that we all agree that the head is the most important part it means we appreciate what the head does it means we appreciate what the foot does and the hand and you get the whole idea right we under there's an appreciation for each other there's another passage in Scripture that Paul writes to a church in Ephesus, and we use this passage often to support shared leadership in our church. And Paul writes, I'm just going to paraphrase, that we're all called for the equipping of the saints. We are the saints. People who are believers in the room are saints. That's what the reference is for, just referring to people who are Christ followers. That in order to equip the people that God's called us to, that we're all designed differently. We all have different roles within that. Some are meant to be apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and shepherds, but we all exist for the betterment of each other. And so in this passage in Corinthians chapter 12, he, what he's basically saying is understanding and appreciating which role you have and the people around you have, it absolutely begins to unlock not just an awareness, but a genuine love and affection for people around you. If, if, if I don't know you and I don't know where you come from, like Dan, Wright, Dan, Dan White talks about, it begins to create division rather than appreciation. But if I can appreciate you as how God's designed you and wired you to be different than me, I end up coming to you saying, hey, how do you see this? Because I don't see it that way. Help me understand and appreciate your perspective. Wow, I never thought of it that way. That's fantastic. We begin to have this unified approach in the process. So let's keep reading. He says, but our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange would a body be if it only had one part? Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. This is really important. This is for, I'll say it for me, this is my conviction, and maybe this is you in the room. This isn't about you, Philip. Stop worrying about your one part. Let's take a bigger picture here. This is about the body. So the moment that I start to think so uh, individualistically about what my part is in the church, in my life, whatever the case is, Paul's writing, obviously spirit-led, to say, look, it's not about you. Focus on the body at whole. There's many parts, there's many Phillips, there's many of us, and although we're designed uniquely and different, the ultimate goal is that we come back to what is God speaking to the body as a whole. It says, the eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head can never say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require the special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the believers so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. So much good stuff in that last paragraph. My challenge to us tonight, just as a general open-ended conversation, 
We talked about this a little bit last week, right? The opening question, if you were here last week, I said, you know, what's your role here at Awaken Church? And do you think that if you weren't here, you would be missed? Or that your role isn't valuable? Kind of a precursor to reading this passage tonight. What's your role? And do you think it's important? Do you think you'd be missed if you weren't here? And I don't mean sitting in attendance of a gathering, although, yes, we want you here. It's an important thing that we gather together weekly for. But I'm speaking to this idea of belonging to something, right? Not just attending something, but belonging to something. So let me take that, that question about what's your role here and where do you see your role, right? Let me take it one step further tonight. Within the body of Christ, how are you working with other people? Within the body of Christ, if you have taken a week or so to think about what's my role, why am I here, what has God called me to do, have I owned that role yet, am I walking in that? If the answer to that you've, you've kind of got some clarity on, then part two of that question is, great, so you understand what your role is, how are you working with other people? As a church, from the top down, we have created, and really top down is probably not the best example, but I'm using that just maybe concentric circles from the center out. Let's use that phrase a little bit better. From the center out, our church is completely wired around shared leadership. Everything that we do, there's more than one person making key decisions, overseeing key ministries, working to care for people, Think about everything. So we have a, we have a co-leadership team. There's five of, us that make, five of us that make up the church staff. Some are paid, some are not. Regardless, all share equality in their roles within the co-leadership team. Now, their roles look different. The things they do look different. So there's, at times, the weight shifts based on what's needed. But there's a shared submission to each other on the co-leadership team. Neil, Jeff, myself, Connie, and Steve, all five of us mutually submit to each other, and we all have different, we're, we're different parts of the body, right? Jeff and I are both super handsome, right? We had that in common, but we are wired very differently, surprisingly, right? If you don't know anything about us, it's too bad Heather's not here. She'll have to listen to this. Just, just clip this one part out for me and give it to her. But at the end of the day, right, Neil and I are wired differently. Steve and I are wired differently. Connie and I are wired differently. All of us are wired differently. If we had five Phillips on the co-leadership team, you would all hate it. You'd find a different church, I promise you, right? We would, we would be constantly, like, tackling new ground. No one would get loved and cared for well. And you guys would all hate all five Phillips, right? It, just, it wouldn't work, right? And so I won't pick anybody else because they're not up here. But all five of us would say something similar in that idea of if you had just us, it wouldn't work that way. There's beauty in the, in the mosaic of our roles together, okay? Let's go one circle out. Then we have our spiritual leadership team. We call it our SLT, spiritual leadership team. Our SLT is made up of 15 people that the co-leaders are also a part of that team, but that team represents kind of our spiritual elders. They help speak into the vision, direction and care of our church. So we're not talking about day-to-day -day activities with the SLT. We're talking through how do we care for our families better through our Forge Kids ministry, right? What, what do we need to do to help improve that area? Hey, we've got a, a finance decision coming up here. Where do you guys feel like the Lord is leading us? Hey, we're considering joining to be a part of this network. Where do you guys see the Lord leading us? Hey, we have this family that needs to be cared for and loved on. We're aware of that. How do we love on them? So we have a spiritual leadership team in place that is meant to be the hands and feet of our church leadership, but they're there to own the church, that to take care of the church. It is not the co-leadership's role exclusively to, to take ownership of the church. It's all 15 of us that do that together. Within that team, you have missional community leaders their spouses, and their missional communities all have discipleship cores within them. Discipleship cores are made up of everywhere from three to four people up to ten people, depending on the missional community that we have. But all four of our missional communities have a leadership team in place. So 
Yes, there may be one or two people that host the group or may provide the main direction at times for the group, but I promise you if I were to have any leader up here, in fact, if you were here last week, Dave said it well, he says, I help host the group, but we have a discipleship core who leads the group. And it's not just a, a false sense of humility. He genuinely believes that it's not his job to lead the group. It's his job to host it, to provide guardrails for where the Lord is leading the group. But it's the, the discipleship core's decision to help lead the group well. All of our groups operate this way. Our Forge Kids ministry is going to be going through a transition that you'll hear about in the next few weeks. We're moving to a shared leadership model, even in our Forge Kids, starting in January. Every aspect of our church is designed around this passage. Around that we are not all hands and feet. We are not all heads and eyeballs, right? We are all different. And that's a good thing. There's an appreciation for that. But I promise you that one of the hardest things that for a church that operates so heavily into shared leadership and into this idea of community, it can be difficult at times because people are messy. We don't all agree, right? So you put five of us in a room to help provide direction. Would it be easier at times if someone just stepped up and just led and other four people got in line? Sure. But that is not, not only biblical, it's not better together. You can make a good decision alone, but I promise you that we will be better together when we are in community. So my first thought around spiritual growth is pretty simply stated as this. We own our spiritual growth, but it is impossible to effectively grow apart from the community. Leave it up here for me for, for a second, Lisa. What I'm saying very simply is there's an onus, an ownership that you have over your own spiritual growth. I can't make you pray, read scripture, live generous lives. I can't make you worship. I can't make you gather in community. I can't make you do any of those things. The, the ownership of that responsibility is on you personally. So that's the first part of this. We own our spiritual growth. But we can never effectively grow, spiritually speaking, apart from being connected in community. I remember in high school, I was being discipled by this guy who's like a spiritual big brother to me. And we went to a guy's house that he knew. And uh, we went and uh, he was a part of a house church a year or two before that, but he wasn't really a part of the community anymore. The guy knew the Bible, probably one of the best biblical scholars I've ever met in my whole life. Knew the Bible backwards and forwards, knew how to quote scripture left and right. Good hearted guy, but he had gotten burned really bad from his church experience. And I will never forget him telling me right to my face as a 17-year-old young man, boy, right, saying to me, hey, I did the whole church thing, but honestly, I connect to God better on my own than being with other people. And at first, that's not completely untrue, right? To give the man some grace, it's not entirely untrue. We can absolutely connect to God individually. We should be connecting to God individually. But the, but the myth in the process, the back end of that that's not true, is that it will never lead him to true effective discipleship and spiritual formation by doing it on his own. So one of the things that, that we constantly have to come back to within the church, within Awakened Church, is this idea of the microwave discipleship, where we just want to do things fast, right? Or do things right, and it's going to take a little bit of time, right? You can go to the grocery store, and you can buy the groceries that you need. You can buy the fresh vegetables you want, right? You can also grow it in your backyard. Now, some of you are terrible at doing this, so don't really do it. Go to the grocery store and buy your groceries, right? But there are a few of you in the room who are pretty good gardeners, right? How many of you guys garden in the spring, summertime? Anybody? All right, yeah. So I, I, uh, I live in an apartment, and so my apartment is small-ish, so, but I love to garden. So this past year, I bought a, uh, uh, an outdoor patio garden, and I garden everything from peppers to herbs to lettuce to tomatoes to, um, yeah, I don't know, smaller stuff, right? Nothing crazy, but it's the basic stuff, okay? Uh, I'm thinking about mainly peppers, I, I love hot stuff, but... 
Um, I, I garden a lot of things in the small amount of space I have. I love doing it. And I love cooking from the things that I produce, right? But it's way easier for me just to go to the store and buy those things. But I enjoy the fruit of my labor far more when I cook with the things that I helped grow, right? You guys at Garden can appreciate that. And so that kind of led me to this next thought that I was thinking about this week when putting the sermon together. We can make progress quickly as individuals, but the true growth happens when we are rooted deep in community. You and I could make progress quickly, right? If you want to memorize scripture and get really good at the Bible reading, right, you can do that fast. But the truth is, if you want to really be transformed by scripture, you need to be rooted in community. And so because of that, I would say making sure that we are constantly applying, we have these 12 pathways, right, as a church we talk about, these 12 pathways that we have, live into those, lean into those, but at the same time, understanding that at the end of the day, if you choose to only walk out your spiritual growth on your own, you will never be really rooted deeply. So think about it this way. I'll give you a very simple example. I remember when I was going through a pretty hard time in my early 20s, I was a part of a church. Uh, it, it, we, the church was closing its doors, and uh, it's a long story. But I remember feeling like as a young pastor, you know what, honestly, if I never work in a church again, I'll be okay. I got pretty jaded, pretty cynical, considered walking away from the whole thing. And I remember meeting with a pastor who had been mentoring me. And he said, Philip, he said, I get how you feel. But it's when these storms come into your life, these things that come, that show your true test of character, that really reveal your heart in the process. And as much as I threw a temper tantrum to him privately, I did the best I could to remain strong in my faith, and I, I'm here today because of the words of encouragement of that man. The storms are going to come, but if you're rooted in community, the storms will not blow you over. This myth out there that this life is great if you're a Christian and just believe the best and positive thinking and prosperity and say a lot of other bad words about what I feel about that if I wasn't preaching to you right now, right? But it, it's, it's not real. It's not truth. It's not in Scripture. But what is in Scripture is that when you and I take this idea of community seriously, when those storms come, and they will come, not if they come, but when they come, I promise you that community is what helps get you through it. If you've ever been alone walking through a storm, you know the weight of the world in those moments. And if you've ever been with people in the midst of storms, you know the freedom that you feel in knowing that you are not alone. Understand that you're a part of the body of Christ is one of the most powerful things we can do. One of the other things that Connie and I talked about this week pertaining to this message, and I just want to put it up here very simply. She said, Philip, I think for a lot of us, we're so focused on spiritual perfection. I said, what do you mean, Connie? She said this way. She said, spiritual perfection is when we focus on the results and on me. We call it discipleship. We call it spiritual formation. But really, I'm, it's about me. What can I do to grow? What can I do to improve? It's not really about spiritual formation. Because when I read through Scripture and I read about spiritual formation, this is probably a better example. Spiritual formation focuses on the journey involving others. You see, there's a journey, and you have to, again, own your part to walk, right? I can't make your feet go for you, but I will absolutely lock arms with you and walk on the journey with you. And that's where spiritual formation happens. Jesus is less interested in the tasks that you accomplish. He's way more interested in the person that you become on the journey. And the moment that we stop focusing so much on doing good and doing right— but focus on becoming like Jesus, the world will see an entirely different brand of Christianity. But sometimes we can be so focused on what can I get out of this? What do I need? 
makes it about us. The culture, especially in America, already has enough individualism present. We don't need more of that from the church. The church should be leading the charge saying, if you choose to lock arms and do things together, you will be far more effective. So my final challenge to you tonight, that strength in numbers isn't about the quantity of people but rather the unity that a community displays. Whether we have a thousand people in this room tonight or ten, whether your missional community has five people in it this week, whether it has 30, whether at your next brunch, whether at your next event, whatever the case is, you've got two people that show up or a hundred. We don't assess these based on the quantity of numbers. We are assessed, the metric that we use is does the, do the people around us see us unified? Do the people around us see us together? We can do a lot of really good tasks together. We can be good together. The sermon series, this whole building up to this point, is that we are better together when we are united together. So understanding what your role is and understanding which part of the body you are is step one. Because if you keep trying to tell me you're a foot, but really you're an eyeball, we're going to keep having a discussion about trying to figure out where you are in this process, right? And that's okay. There's a journey for that, figuring out who you are, how God's wired you. But when we step back and realize that I'm one part of a much bigger body, Paul says whether you're a slave, free, Greek, Gentile, whatever the case is for you, there's one body with many parts and God uses them all. There are some really cool things that our missional communities and our church is going to be doing and being a part of in 2020 we can do good things or we can be united and accomplish some amazing God things. But it's whether or not you're, you're willing to be a part of that community, being better together, being rooted and being willing to walk on the journey. There's someone in your life, I promise you right now, there's someone in your life that you know is walking through something hard. How you choose to love on them and, and stand with them in the midst of the storm, that's community. That's better together. That's the body of Christ at work. There may be people here even tonight that have lost hope in other people because you haven't seen them follow through with things or, be, or succeed in things. And I just want to invite you tonight to maybe remove some of those calluses from those wounds and be open to this idea that, yeah, it's hard. It can hurt. But we are far better together than we ever could be on our own. Let's pray. God, tonight, I ask that you would help us to peel back some of the layers that we feel, some of the things that we walked in tonight that are, that are scars, that come from hard places. And God, I'm thankful that your spirit, you just meet us there. You don't tell us to get over it. You don't ignore it. You meet us there. You wrap your spiritual arms around us. And you do that by providing people to walk with us in the midst of the storms. God, may we be a community that's the first to celebrate great things happening. And may we also be the first ones on the scene when something happens and we need to be there to walk with people through the hard times. May we be a church that people say, I, don't, I really don't know if I believe everything that you guys believe, but I, I want to be a part of a community that's there to care, 
and model the unity that you guys have. God, would you put us in front of people to display that unity, not for our sake, but for yours. And God, would you convict us of those moments when we forget that we are one part of a much larger body, so focused on what our part does, what our part needs. Help us to remember that we're connected to this beautiful mess of a church and how we move forward in that is a reflection of how we understand you and your role in our lives. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you that we are better together. Would you continue to move us in that direction? In Jesus' name, amen.